So, good afternoon, welcome. I think most people know my name, but it says I'm supposed to say that. So, uh, my name is Robert Klein. I'm Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs. Thank you for coming for the fifth Campus Wide Leadership Series presentation for this year. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our colleagues who are watching online. A special thanks to the continued support of the University of Kansas Health System, who's helped to make the series possible. And so, it's a good partnership we have around this series. I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Dave Rao. Is that for, is that for me? <laughs> uh, you may recognize Dave. He's the Director of Projects and Planning here at the University of Kansas Medical Center and has served in this capacity since April of 2013. Duties required of his role are diverse. They include overseeing a master planning, landscaping, space management, construction management for the medical center, uh, dealing with me. Uh, we should add that. Um, and he's been at KU since 2003, but prior to that, Dave served as the Director of Facilities, it's the same job basically, at the Kansas City Zoo and worked in private business. Uh, okay, before we get to the title, uh, Dave really uh, is one of the people around this institution who thinks outside the box and looks at places around the campus and sees things that I don't see. He knows my traditional line, which is, if I see a blueprint, I see lines. I cannot interpret what those are, and he is extremely helpful on that level and on a grander scale for the entire campus. The title of today's presentation is Leaders Among Us, A Conversation with Dave Rao. Please join me in welcoming Dave. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here and taking time out of your busy lunch hours to, to come hang out with me. I'd like to thank Dr. Klein and Jenny Memmott and the campus leadership group for having me here and allowing me to speak. It's kind of an honor and a humbling experience to talk to your colleagues. I'd like to thank Ron Fowler, um, who told me when I left to go to the zoo that he would have me back here one day, and he came back and found me, uh, and he showed a lot of courage in putting, him, putting me in a position that um, was a little risky for him. Uh, and it uh, showed a lot of courage and a lot of, a lot of uh, vision on his part, I think. I'd also like to thank all of the facilities people that I work with every day. <laughs> because over my career here, they've always made me smarter. They share their knowledge. They do all of these things. And it's a really honor to work with you guys. I'd also like to thank Toastmasters, uh, especially Dan Arbuckle, Brad Anderson, and all the other members of Toastmasters who have been helping me prep for this, who this would have been much much more hideous event had they not been working with me. So when they asked me to do this, uh, one of the things you need to know about me is I have a rather Marxian philosophy on life. And I'm not talking Karl Marx. I'm talking Groucho Marx. <laughs> For the young people, just Google it. <laughs> Groucho has a saying that I would never belong to a club that would have me as a member. And that's a little self-deprecating, but kind of keeps you humble, let you know where you are and where you're supposed to be. So I looked at the list of people that prior speakers. You know, I don't have 14 Big 12 championships and a national title. <laughs> I'm not a World Series walk-off home run Hall of Fame baseball player. I haven't started a children's choir, and I'm not a, 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 an athlete, either para or Olympic or otherwise. So I guess I'm here because I kind of have uh, a PhD in the med center. That's how I would describe it. So how many people in here participate in Jayhawk Way? Okay, a large group. So in Jayhawk Way, they start off with conversation stacking. You know, how are you? How do you meet a you know, Just questions you would ask. And one of the things they always work around to is, where are you from, or are you from Kansas City? And you'd think a guy that had been here for 50 years, lived in Kansas City 50 years, would immediately say yes, but it's not that simple. So I'm going to go way back to the beginning. My father was born here in 1920. My mother was born here in 1922. 1938, my father graduated from Central High School. My mother graduated from East High School. My father was playing semi-pro baseball and taking classes at junior college, and he decided to join the Navy. 
and off we went. To say we moved a lot, understatement. My oldest brother was in 12 different schools. My sister went to four different high schools. Imagine that, starting high school over every year. What a yucky thing to do. My brother was born in Moline, Illinois. My sister was born in San Diego, California. My brother Don, who many of you know, was born in the Pacific on Midway Island. One mile wide, two miles long. The Seabees actually flew in a crew to build a 12 by 12 building so my mother could give birth. <laughs> you were there. <laughs> so my story starts at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, we, my parents rented a farm uh, outside of Dayton. Uh, I was born. Uh, my sister, who had two brothers already, uh, when she found out the news, she said, take him back, take him back, I wanted a sister. <laughs> she didn't have time because we immediately pulled up stakes and moved to Chincoteague, Maryland. It's a, right outside of Baltimore. There's an island, Chincoteague, Assateague. It's big claim to fame is they have wild ponies on that island. They drive them across the bay every year, cull the herd so they don't overpopulate the island. Um, the Wonderful World of Disney, for those of you that are old enough to remember that, did a, did a movie called Misty about the ponies on uh, Chincoteague. We busted out of Chincoteague and moved to Boston, Massachusetts. My father was a navigator on the USS Wasp, which was an aircraft carrier stationed out of the uh, naval shipyards in Boston. Came home one day. Said to my mother, can't tell you where I'm going, don't know when I'm coming back. Off he went. She was at home with four kids under 10, um, and she managed. <laughs> From there, we moved to our first uh, tour of duty in the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. We did that for a couple of years. My father got promoted, and we are off to Kenitra, Morocco, northern Africa. My father was the commander of that Navy base, and um, my older brother didn't like it too much, so he left after six months. Um, but for a kid growing up, it was a great place to be. We were 15 years out of World War II. There were pillboxes and army stuff buried in the sand, and we would dig and find all these great things. So it was a, it was a great environment for a kid that was in the second, third, fourth grade uh, to hang out and play. The most ex probably the most memorable thing that happened there is um, the King of Morocco passed away while we were there, and his 19-year-old son ascended to the throne, King Hussein. And it was about the same time that John F. Kennedy was elected president. So Kennedy invited him to come to Washington for a state visit. He went, and they flew him back on Air Force One. And they landed Air Force One at my father's Navy base. So we got to get up close and personal. And um, I had some pictures, but they were too grainy to show you the, uh, of the plane. After two and a half, three years in Morocco, came back to Washington, D.C. My father worked in the Pentagon for Robert McNamara, and the uh, secretary. he was the Secretary of Defense. And we ended up our career there in the, about 1967. And my father finally moved back to Kansas City, where his mother and sisters and everybody lived. So I was a child of the 60s. Golden age of television. Everything great was happening. Um, it was kind of like the internet now. It was, you know, when you got your first TV, that was a really exciting thing. Went along. And we were a military family, and so things were pretty regimented. We had dinner every night at 6 o'clock. Don't be late. Sat down with my father and my mother, and we went, ate dinner, and then we immediately went to watch the evening news. And in those days, it wasn't a 365-day, you know, 24-hour-a-day, seven-day news cycle. You got your news from either reading the print media, or you got it at 6 o'clock. There were guys like Harry Reasoner, Howard K. Smith, Huntley and Brinkley, Walter Cronkite. These were the most trusted guys in America, and they delivered the news every night. And the 60s were a tumultuous time. We had civil rights, mid-Vietnam War. Um, there was just a myriad of things going on. And as we watched every night, my father, part of the military industrial complex, would always say, look at these people. People are sheep. People are sheep, and sheep get shorn. He said, would you follow this guy? Would you follow him? Would you do this? Would you? He said, jump off a bridge. Would you go with him? And so as I reflect back on this as part of the series is about what leadership is, you know, leadership is a lot of things to a lot of people, and there's different views on that almost everywhere you look. And we were watching leaders like Martin Luther King every night, Malcolm X, Angela Davis. We were seeing the Kennedys. Uh, they trot out Churchill and, and Truman from time to time. Just, a, just really Patton, uh, General MacArthur. All of these people that were really considered to be historical figures that were really, really um, examples of great leadership. You may not agree with all their views, but they were there doing their thing. 
And in doing so, um, it made me think about all the ways that you have all these visions of leaders being all these great people, and there were a lot of people that, were, that people followed that were not very good people. I mean, Adolf Hitler out of World War II, maybe Stalin if your perspective is that direction. Charles Manson, I mean, people followed him. Jim Jones took a thousand people from San Francisco, took them to Ghana. Didn't work out very well from them. So I guess the message here and the point I'm trying to make is, is that be careful who you follow. Choose your leaders wisely. Um, it may have repercussions. Career-wise, I went to Rockhurst High School here in Kansas City, graduated from KU. Jimmy Carter was president. Gas lines were long. Interest rates were at 18%. And I went to work for a plumbing wholesaler. And my first job for them was I would sit in a room with a bunch of blueprints. And I didn't know at the time that that was going to help me later in life. It was just a job. And I would sometimes be at the parts counter selling parts. But most of the time I was in a room looking at blueprints and I was learning how to read legends and look for the symbols and go through and look and see what things that we sold we could take off of that and put in bids on. And I did that for about two and a half years. Next step was I went in business with my oldest brother. And we sold and distributed coin laundry equipment. We owned our own company. At one point we had 11 laundromats and three dry cleaning plants and we designed and built laundry equipment and laundromats and dry cleaning plants for other people. And so when you're the owner of a company, you get to be the president and the vice president, and you get to be the secretary and the treasurer, you get to be the sales guy. You also get to be the guy at the end that cleans the toilets and sweeps the floors and dumps the trash. So it keeps you kind of at an even keel. When you do those things, it teaches you a lot of valuable lessons. Um, very humbling. So we did that for about 30 years, very successful. My oldest brother got to a point where he didn't want to work anymore. And his kids didn't have any interest. My kids didn't have any interest. We started looking around, so we started downsizing the company. And it became apparent to me I better find a job. So I started looking around. Zone manager, Kansas City University Medical Center. So I came and applied. I think I interviewed with Rita Clifford, John Ferraro, and Greg Franklin. Um, they hired me. And there we were. Anybody can be successful. Anybody. And over the last 25 or 30 years, everything's gone in this really technologically advanced way. Everybody's talking about data. Where's your spreadsheet? I want to mine some data. What are the metrics? And you have all these numbers. And I think if you talk to most young people today, they're in high school, I don't know how many of you have high school kids. If you asked them what they were going to do, some of them have a laser vision. You know, I'm really good at doing this. This is my career path. I'm going to medical school, and I'm going in that direction. And I'm saying that's about 10 or 15% of the high school population. The rest of them are going to go, I have no idea what I'm going to do. So how do those people become successful? How do they get to where they're going to go? So when I was starting my senior year, January of that year, they sent us out into the community to do community work. Go here, go there. We were at the Jewish Community Center. We were at Catholic Charities. Uh, they sent us to retirement centers. I personally worked at a daycare at 55th and Paseo. So we did this for six weeks. Mid-February, we returned. Everybody's got senioritis. Nobody wants to be in school, obviously. And they're going to bring in a guy, and he's going to talk to us about career advancement. So they put us in a room, in a, went to the cafeteria, I think it was. It's about 160 guys in our class. Guy walks in and says, hey, before I start my presentation, I got a couple questions. So he says, how many of you guys are taking AP courses? How many of you are taking college credit courses? About 25, 30 guys raise their hand. He goes, perfect. You guys go over there and stand. So those 30 guys walk over. How many of you are on the A honor roll? 30 guys, 40 guys, join your friends over here. So he's got us divided into two groups. Those of us on the right group are saying, it's kind of like a Ferris Bueller moment, you know? <laughs> we've got the geeks, we've got the losers, the jocks, the stoners, the motorheads, the goss. We're all over here and we're thinking, oh, we're going to get to hear how smart these guys are. Absolutely. He walks right over here and he says, you guys are really, really 
smart, you've got natural abilities, but you've worked hard, you've done well in school, and you've set, your up, set yourselves up to be a big success in life. You're going to be the doctors. You're going to be the lawyers. You're going to be the researchers. You're going to be the architects and the engineers. You're going to have good professional careers. Congratulations. Your parents should be really proud of you. You should be proud of yourselves. And he turns to us, and we're all standing there, oh boy. <laughs> and he says, I'll get back to you. <laughs> I got one more thing to say to you people, and you better listen. You better listen really good to this, because it's really important. See these guys over here? You better get to know them. You better make friends with them, because they are going to be the guys that own the companies that you work for. And what a message to send all these people, you know? Anybody can be successful. It can happen anywhere, anytime. Personal relationships. Personal relationships and opportunity. Those are critically important in your life. Recognizing when to make a move, when not to make a move. Taking the risk to make those moves. I'm going to give you a couple examples from my, my career here. I came to the Med Center, worked as a zone manager in the central zone. I actually was here about four months before they went into the zone system, so I was in one of the shops for a while. We split into the zones. I was the central zone manager. Then I was the south zone manager. And then they moved me to the north zone. And while I, when they moved me to the north zone, they were building the Hemingway building. All the research, uh, the 250 some thousand square feet of research. And as a zone manager, you have your 13 or 14 buildings and you're, you've got your crew of guys and you're trying to work and get all of these things done and, and, and you know, provide a customer service. So as a zone manager, your direct report is to the director of facilities and the associate director of facilities and those are the people you meet with and they tell you, give you your marching orders and you can do that. So you don't go to very many high level meetings. So they called a meeting, second floor Murphy, which I had never been called to a meeting there in the four years I had worked up to that point. And it was about what was going to happen to Hemingway. We're in mid-construction. We have to move all these researchers in. We have to backfill all the labs. Um, we have to do all the, the associated costs with that. How is that all going to work out? And who's going to manage that? How's that going to work? And so the, you know, the architects, the engineers, the building designers, some of the deans, um, the prior, uh, uh, Ed Phillips, the prior uh, support services uh, chancellor, vice chancellor, he was one of the meeting, and so they were talking all these things over. Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? Should we hire an outside consultant? Should we bring someone in? And I was sitting in that meeting watching this all transpire, and I was thinking to myself, should I? Should I? And I finally said, after the, in a pause in the conversation, I said, yeah. You know, it's my zone. I'm going to manage the building in the long run. I think I can handle this. Uh, be harder for a zone manager to do today because we had 15 or 20 guys in a zone where we had six, seven. But I said, I said, I can do this. And uh, they waited about two seconds before they said, okay, it's yours. <laughs> when, we, when we moved into the building, we, we were trying to meet a certain deadline for, to get it open. So we asked the, you know, the contractor to open the fourth floor, finish first, third floor, second. So we were actually still working on the three floors below when we started moving into the fourth floor. Hired a couple of temps, met every truck. Unloaded all the new equipment, minus 80s, minus 20s, minus 4s, incubators, mass spectrometers, whatever they ordered, it was coming, we were unloaded it. What I didn't realize at the time when I volunteered was it going to provide me the opportunity to meet every single researcher on campus. Every single one. Anybody that was moving to that building. And they came in, brand new building, looked around, Oh, I really like this lab, but this is not the way I work. I've got to move this over here, and you've got to move that over there, and we have to, my minus, my minus 20 is in the wrong spot, and the emergency power has to be over there. And so we spent a year, a year and a half after the building opened making all of those changes. And so I worked with them all the way through that. And I didn't realize the time, but it allowed me to develop a sense of trust. They, you know, I didn't always get it right. Um, you know, things went south. Uh, they went south quick, but... I think I developed a modicum of respect within that community, and it really did me a lot of good in my career going forward. Second thing that happens, when that was all done and said and done with, I was looking at my job, I was a North Zone manager, 
And I was telling myself, this is not where I wanted to end up. I didn't want to be a North Zone manager for the rest of my career. And I, I didn't see any avenue to get where I needed to go. I wasn't sure how that was going to happen. So I started thinking about, you know, maybe I should look for another job. Maybe I should get my resume together. And I was in that process, just trying to think, think through that. It was right before Thanksgiving. We were going to see my daughter in Michigan on our way for Thanksgiving weekend. I'm on my cell phone, I get a call. It's the lady that worked, lives across the street from me. Her sons and my daughter went to grade school together. She was a recruiter. She said, hey, I know you're really happy at the med center and you know, you're in facilities there, but would you be interested in um, interviewing for the director of facilities job at the zoo? I said about 30 seconds, I said, yeah. Yeah, I'd be interested in doing that. Be like running off and joining the circus, going to the zoo, right? <laughs> so I went to the, I, we came back for Thanksgiving, second week of December, went to the zoo for the interview, interview for a couple hours. Thought it went well. Was expecting to hear something. December, nothing. January, nothing. No, February, not a word. So I was thinking, well, you know, I'm going to find a better plan or do, you know, stay here or do whatever. First week of March, they called and said, hey, we're going to interview you. Went in for a second interview. I must have done something right because they offered me the job. So the task that left me, coming back to the medical center, we had a new vice chancellor of uh, support services then. And I did not know Stephanie well at the time. And I had to go in her office and tell her I was leaving. So I walked in, sat down with her. I said, I really enjoyed my time here. It's been great. I have an opportunity to be the director of facilities at the Kansas City Zoo, and I just wanted to tell you that I'm leaving, and I wanted to do this right. And oh, by the way, never, ever, ever, ever burn a bridge. Don't ever burn that bridge, because you never know when it's going to come back. So Stephanie was totally gracious. She said, you know, I understand. She said, sure you're going to do this, or you want to go. I said, yeah, I've already committed. I'm, you know, I'm trying to be a man of my word. I'm going to go. And she did two things that were very interesting there. The next two things that happened, she said, with a smile on her face, you're going to be back here one day. And I said, well, you know, I think this zoo thing's going to be pretty cool. I, I, don't, I, don't think I'm, I don't think I'm coming back. But I thanked her. And then she did another really interesting thing. She said, would you do me a favor? I said, if I can, yeah, sure. She said, I'm, 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 I'm trying to recruit someone, and I'm going to go interview him. We're going to have a cup of coffee. Would you come with me? And I was flattered because I'm leaving. And she wants my opinion on someone that she might be bringing in. So we went and had coffee, and um, it went well. I think we hired him. Uh, so relationships matter. Seizing opportunities matter. It's an important part. So I'm going to take a little moment here. I'm going to take a David Letterman moment. Some of you have already seen her. This is my mother, um, Jean Rao. How <laughs> so you're saying I didn't lie too much. Some of us would pay money for pictures. So, uh, you know, part of part of your success in your profession, whatever you do, whether whether you're you know this mathematician person that's got their straight path, or whether you're someone like me, you know, my career is like Alice in Wonderland. Uh, no matter where you're going, any road's going to get you there. And that's kind of how it worked out. But at every step along the way, I did things serendipitously that have made me smarter and really tied into what I'm doing today. So uh, being well-rounded. My mother had three sons and a daughter. And her three sons kicked every ball, threw them, broke every window in the house. You know, we were constantly, we were consumed with sports, uh, just had no interest in anything else. And she made it her life's mission to make sure that we saw other things in life. Everywhere we went. When we were in Boston, Paul Revere's house, Plymouth Rock, Lexington, Concord. We went to Gettysburg, Williamsburg, Jamestown, Smithsonian, Natural History Museum, Museum of Modern Art. We saw every stage play, kicking and screaming. <laughs> she would play classical music. She would, you know, just everything that she did in her, she could do in her power to make sure that we had a strong base. And I didn't realize it at the time, but it serves me well now because I can walk 
everywhere I go, I may not be an expert, but I've heard of it. And I can, I can converse about it. And so it's really, a, it's really an important thing to be well-rounded. And thanks, Mom. Appreciate it. <laughs> I'm gonna... So I'm going to tell you three stories about my mother quickly. So when my mother was 75, the Internet was just starting to come along. 96 years young last month, by the way. <laughs> She's 75, the Internet's starting to come along, and she says, Everybody's buying home computers. I have to have a home computer. So she goes and buys a home computer. And she sets it up in her office. And a couple weeks after she got it, I was over there visiting. She was very proud of herself. She took me up in her office and said, oh, look at this. This is going to be great. I can do this, this, and this. Conversation went on for about two or three minutes. She said, I got to go. I said, what do you mean you got to go? She goes, I have things to do. I have to go. I said, where could you possibly need to go? She goes, I'm going to college. I've enrolled at Johnson County Junior College. I said, really? What are you going to do there? And she goes, I'm taking computer science classes because I want to know how this thing works. <laughs> and off she went. Fast forward 15 years. She's 89, 90. She has, she has a landline, still has a landline, will always have a landline. Somewhere in her mid-80s, she bought a flip phone put it in her purse in case she had an emergency and you know, couldn't, needed to get a hold of somebody. I don't think I ever had her flip phone number. And I don't think she ever called me on her flip phone, but it was there. So we're at a family gathering. She starts asking everybody about their phones. She says, what kind of phone do you have? I got an iPhone. Well, what's it do? Well, it's, you know, it does all these things. She goes, I think I'm going to get an iPhone. <laughs> I said, mother, why would you spend $500 on an iPhone you don't use the phone you have? And she looked at me as only a mother can, right in my eyes, and she pointed her finger at me, and she said, I will not be left behind. <laughs> and so, about a year ago, I go to her house. Her second floor of her bedroom is cleaned out. She's got easels and canvas and oil paints. Now in her 70s, she was taking some art lessons and, and dabbling in oil painting, but she got too busy. National Women in the Arts, Central Exchange, Nelson Gallery, so she couldn't do it. Lately, she started back. She's taking art lessons one day a week, and she has her computer that she knows how to use, and so she pulls them up on YouTube and takes art lessons from all these <laughs> artists on, on YouTube. And she sits in her, you know, she's got this room, and you know, I'm in nine months' time, there are canvases everywhere, finished canvases, they're all over the place. So what are you going to do with all these? And I shouldn't have asked that question, because I realized at the time, she wasn't doing this to give them away. She was doing this for her own self-worth. And so I think the message there is don't ever stop improving. Don't ever stop learning. Don't ever stop making yourself better. So if you think about all of these things and you talk about life and leadership and all of those things, make sure you know who you're following. It's really important. Choose your leaders wisely. Personal relationships matter. Seize opportunities. When an opportunity sticks out of its hand, you better shake it because it's not going to hug you. Never stop learning. Never stop improving, and don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. And really, in a nutshell, it's really not about your now. It's not what, you know, right here and now. It's about your next. It's what happens after this. So I didn't quite fill my 45 minutes, but I've run out of material. <laughs> so. So can you tell us about the zoo? <laughs> well, I, I tell you, I can. I, I'd be happy to. My friend Jeff Hall, who was the COO at the zoo that is now president of uh, Wayside Waves, uh, he was my boss at the zoo. Um, we know him well. We, 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 we. Where's Samson? <laughs> well, we could talk about anything or nothing, whatever, whatever you wish. How was the zoo? The zoo was fabulous. It really was. Uh, you know, I... I I spent just exactly a year there. It was April to April. Uh, and I was really excited to take the job. 
Uh, I really did think I'd be there for the rest of my life just because I thought it was going to be so cool. The behind the scenes, um, seeing the animals, uh, and seeing the people, the dedicated people there that aren't getting highly paid, that come in every day, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, snow, wind, there was no, there was no not coming. They were there. Um, it was just really gratifying to see that kind of dedication. Uh, uh, you know, zoos are not really about um, putting animals on display anymore. They're about conservation and how do we how do we breed animals to put them back in the wild? It's 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 and it's a dicey subject. It's not it's not an easy one to to handle. Um, but it was really really a fascinating place. Uh, I. I, I and I have some funny, I do have some funny stories about being with Jeff and being behind the scenes because Jeff knows everything about every walking, crawling species on the planet. Uh, but uh, uh, I couldn't resist to come back here. Um, you know, when Ron came back and said, you know, I, I wanted you to, I want you to work here. And I said, what do you want me to do? And he said, projects and planning. And I really kind of, I said, are you crazy? <laughs> and, you know, his vision, his leadership, you know, he got me here and, and uh, it's been probably the funnest five years I've ever had working. Well, um, Dave, I never believe I could clap for you for anything. I know, I know. <laughs> but eventually I did today. That was a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, you always think you have stories until you listen to other people's stories. And then you realize how small your story is next to theirs. And that was just a fascinating story about all the trips and how, where all the places you have been. But the question that I have for you, I, I really relate with all the major points of your presentation. But the question I have for you is, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? Looking back, and considering the presentation you gave today, are there things you wished you had done in the earlier days and any plans to address them? I think about that from time to time, I actually do. And I, the answer is yes, there are things. There's one thing I would change is um, my mother, very early on in my career when I was in my 30s, wanted me to get out of the laundry business. She said, you know, you're, 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 you're you're not using your talents to the fullest, she used to tell me. And oh, by the way, make no mistake, she still sends me magazine articles. She cut, you know, she's sending, she's, my mother Snapchat, she's got a Twitter account, she's got an Instagram. <laughs> I don't do any of those things, so I'm behind, so now I've got to catch up. So, but, but, you know, she did, she always used to say, you know, you're wasting your time, you know, and it wasn't a waste of time, it was a good business, we, we, we were successful. But I think that had I gotten into the business world, um, who knows? And I'm not complaining. I love everything I've done. And so, <laughs> I can't either. <laughs> Microphone malfunction. Okay. Um, I really enjoyed this story you told about uh, when you were divided in two groups um, between those that were assured success and those who uh, are running businesses in the future. Did the gentleman who divided you say what it was about your group? Um, or did you, or what do you think it was about your group that we should learn from people who take a different path? So, a long time ago, I don't exactly remember what he said after that specifically. Um, I would just say it goes to, you know, the guys in that group um, really, it was a, such an eclectic bunch, but I mean, truly highly successful people. One of those guys got into bottled water before bottled water was a thing. He said, he's a one percenter now. Uh, you know, it, it's about... I, and I think it goes back to being well-rounded, to have a big base, and, 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 you know, there's not always a laser path to go. And I think, I think that those people actually were similar to me. They didn't know what they were going to do, they didn't know how they were going to get there, and they just started in life. And sometimes that's it, taking the first step is, is the key. And I, 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 
and you know, I think one of two or three of our, our classmates passed away last last December, January, and February successively, and it had spurred the rest of us. So when we now meet every Friday or every third Friday uh, for drinks, and we usually get 25 or 30 guys, and it's never the same 25 or 30 guys. But it's just that kind of um, broad base and you know connectivity and personal relationships and and all of those things matter. And I think. They sometimes so there's so if you're talking about you know it's, algorithms are a big thing now and you're, there's thin data and there's fat data and the thin data is all the stuff that the people that are really mathematical wizards and scientific people like my friend Michelle they can they can cram all these data down but somebody has to analyze that data somebody has to say and how does that relate to humanity you know George Soros one of the richest guys in the world his major was in humanities and philosophy he made his money because he could see where the human race was going and look at the numbers and make that translation. Made him a billion dollars. You know, Steve Jobs couldn't write code. He was just, he was just this guy. He dropped out of school. He went to India and studied Zen, uh, Zen Buddhism. Came back to the States and hooked up with Wozniak in a garage. Wozniak was a genius. But he was a visionary. And he could tell what the people wanted. So it's, 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 I think that's part of it too. It's the ability to, to, to create thin data and to be these mathematical wizards to do these things. But somebody's got to interpret it and, and, and relay those messages to the masses. I can throw it. <laughs> Thanks for just handing it. Dave, tell us about how you lead. Like what, uh, with all the things that you've learned through your experiences, through your career, and then your years here, now that you're a, a titled leader within the organization, what, ha, how? G give us some of the how-tos. <laughs> That's the hardest question to answer because, you know, until I was invited to do this, I really didn't realize I was a leader. I don't, I, I, you know, I just try to come every day. I think part of the battle is showing up. Showing up and having the right attitude, um, and 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 building a collaborative group. You know, uh, I think that's one of the things that you and Ron and, and you know have been doing. And and you know, I'm in on that. I think it's it's so fascinating to get all these people together that are sharing their knowledge. You know, I didn't. I, when you hired me for this job, I thought you were crazy <laughs> because I didn't. I didn't. I, I'm not your typical person to be doing this. But I came back and the, and the people that were in the jobs that were ancillary to mine that reported to me uh, were willing to share their knowledge. You know, Dave Rowland, who was the outgoing um, uh, campus architect, very gracious, you know, taught me, you know, he took me to the first architects meeting at, at the state level and those guys, well, he's not an architect, what's he doing here? Uh, but, you know, just the collaborative effort that you can get within people if you just show up every day, have a positive attitude, lead by example, and, and you know, don't be a victim. You know, don't sit around and say, well, what was me? You know, just because we're state employees doesn't mean we have to act like state employees. We can be greater than that. Okay, follow-up question. So um, in the introduction, um, Dr. Klein talked about out-of-the-box thinking. That's a characteristic huh. of you. Um, tell us some of your out-of-the-box ideas that, um, and, and what's ahead for us. Well... <laughs> What's ahead for us? Uh, yeah, what's our next? <laughs> well, our, ne our current next is the anatomy lab. I'm, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure because we weren't asking the state for money that the Board of Regents approved that yesterday. So um, moving the anatomy lab from the second floor to the fourth floor of our major, well, we have to go through the state process so we won't be able to start that till next spring, but I, I, I think that'll happen. Uh, it'll, it'll be one of several sizes. It could be small six million dollar part of the project or if the hospital joins us and, and wants to put surgical skills in there which makes a lot of sense uh, then it could become a ten million dollar project and if we get a little extra money we could take part of the third floor as well and uh, you know have a really grand anatomy lab to go along with our health education building thinking out of the box you know these guys know they have lunch with me every day they never know what's going to come out of my mouth <laughs> So, so, a lot of it's flying by the seat of your pants. Um, I, th I think again, it goes back to, to having a broad interest, you know, level of interest in lots of different things. And and you know, you work at a place 25, 30, 15 years. Um, you walk in every day. If you walk in like this, you see the same stuff every day. So you know, I try to take walks around the campus when I've got a little time and just be by myself and just look at stuff and go, wow, what if we did 
What if we had the money to do this? Wouldn't that be crazy? I mean, it's, it really is just that simple. It's just about walking around, looking at things, and try to look at them through a different lens. And a lot of that comes from the people I, that you know I work with, you. the landscaping people. You know, a lot of that uh, out of the box thinking. You know, they come to me and say, "Oh, what if we did this?" And yeah, let's go, let's do it. You know, not saying no to ideas is, is a part of it too. You know, even if you can't do them, don't say no. How easy was it for you to transition from being a business owner and an employer to being an employee? That's a great question. So having worked for myself for 30 years, I had nobody telling me what to do, except for my brother. And he would get hoarse because I would hardly ever listen to him. Uh, uh, it, it was a transition, you know, because I was, I was alone. Most of, most of my stuff, was it was just me. I had to get up in the morning. I knew where I had to be. I knew where my sales calls were. I knew where my construction sites were. And I just had, I was just expected to be there and do that. So it was, it was being self-driven. And when you come to an organization like this, especially at the time I came here in 2003, um, uh, pretty close to the, to the split when we split from the hospital, um, I would say that morale was not terribly high. Uh, the, the, the structure was not very conducive to, to being innovative. Um, so, and then being part of a group, having, having, to, having to have people I had to interact with. Uh, I'll, I'll tell a little story on myself that uh, I was working with James, and I, I was James. I was James's worst nightmare. I, I, I worked here three years as his own manager before I ever realized we had a planning department. I didn't know we had architects and engineers, and so I was out in the zone, and I was used to being in the real, in my own world, where I could do whatever I wanted, and quite often I did. And so uh, they were having, I was in the south zone, and we were in the front of Olathe, and James, I, they came to me and said, well, every time it rains, the doors, it floods in these sliding glass doors. And I said, well, we'll just fix this. We'll just, get a, we'll just put a new trench drain in here. And so I was telling James I was going to do that. He said, you can't do that. And I said, why? He goes, we've been trying to do that for years. I said, well, why can't I do it? He said, because the hospital won't let us. I said, what do you mean the hospital won't let us? He goes, it's a patient entrance. They will never let us close this down. So a couple days went by, and I got to thinking about it, and I called the guy, and I said, came out and got a bid, and I want to put a trench drain in here, and I want to connect it to the drain down there. Can we do that? And he goes, yeah. Yeah, how much is it? He told me. So I, I didn't consult anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I just went out there. And, it's like a Tuesday morning, and these guys are jackhammering the thing in to put the drain in. And oh my God, there's an army of people from the hospital. <laughs> And they're over there, and James, James was our liaison, really, with them at the time. And so, he, God bless him, he took the brunt of it. <laughs> they, were, they were yelling and screaming, you can't do this, you can't do this, you blocked the entrance. And I said, we got a door down here. <laughs> and so, when I realized that what I had done, or what I theoretically didn't think was a big deal, we got a bunch of yellow tape, and we taped it all off. And I stood out there for three days, and this was the middle of summer, my bald head, and it was hot. And I stood out there in the sun three days, and I stood on the corner, and I caught every person, and I escorted them to the right door and got them in. And I did that for three days until they were done. So there's a right way to do the wrong thing, and that was probably one of them. We could, we could have water run under the doors, though, so I, you know. <laughs> Hi, Dave. Thank you so much for your um, candid discussion about your life and your career. And I, I just am wondering about, I think about the health education building and the quickness in which that needed to go up. And I'm just wondering how you balance both sort of the, the broader vision and idea of what um, a project is going to be, but also handle all the nitty gritty details. Because that's, I, to me, I think a really, um, you know, Something that a, a, a really good leader does is they're able to keep their eye on the bigger vision, but also handle the the nuts and bolts. So, well, you know, when when I said they were crazy when they hired me, and 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 I I didn't know what I didn't know, uh, but I, I I think it really boils down to the people we have in facilities. You know, um, Manu Sharma and Pekka Holmberg and Nan Josephson and uh, A.J. Woodward and at the time Anita Ireland and the people we hired, you know, we brought really good people in. You know, we hired two new architects right before we started that project. Uh, we had a really good staff. Uh, and you don't do any of that stuff by yourself. It's a, it's a thousand meetings. There's all sorts of people involved. And in our organization, it's top to bottom. Everybody, everybody had a hand in it. Um, so uh, from, from the getting the job done, it's about 
uh, having uh, a team that works on it and delegating the right task to the right person. I guess if, that's, if that was my part in it, that's probably what I did. Um, the vision of the campus, you know, we did, we've done three master plans since 2003, I think. It was, and the last one was done by an outside firm in 2011. And when I took this job, um, I hired two brand new architects and they walked in and said, well, can we do the master plan? Can we do the master plan? So I went to Stephanie and I said, you know, why are we going to spend all this money doing, having someone else come in and revisit it again? They've already done it for us. I mean, it's a document that sits on a shelf and it gets dusty and nobody really looks at it. And so what we decided to do, and I talked to Ron and we, we, we came up with this plan to, to make our master plan a living, breathing document. So we're, we're putting um, all of the one lines for the utilities and all of this, we're trying to capture all of this information. And I've just hired a brand new engineer a couple weeks ago, and one of his jobs is going to be to do these building by building footprints of how the piping is in the buildings. So that when we're gone, whoever comes in and takes our place doesn't, they, they know where to look. It's going to be kind of like the Bible. So, you know, they gave us the permission to put, put this master plan together. Um, the vision for it, uh, you know, the hospital is building down state line with their next two towers. Uh, the vision for it was laid out in the Canon Master Plan of 2011, at least some of it was. And we always have to tweak it because uh, when leadership changes, what the leadership wants changes. Uh, but we have, a, I think we're on a good track right now. We have, we have a good clear path of where we need to go. We just need to do creative things, work with the hospital, um, and, and try to figure out how to make this better for the whole campus instead of just the university or just the hospital. Dave, you know that there have been a lot of visitors here lately mm -hmm. from other schools coming and looking at this place. Take a few minutes and explain how you would describe the new HEB and the campus to somebody who had never seen it before. What is, what is this like? Well, we just completed the largest construction project on this campus in the last at least 30 years, maybe even more. Uh, I think that the, 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 the two things that have made a difference is on, uh, as far as all this goes is the leadership uh, of, of the people in charge um, and the willingness to, to do things that we hadn't done in the past. You know, the, the, the HEB is a beautiful building and our whole goal there was to have an iconic gateway to our campus. Uh, and I think we've accomplished that. That building will hold that corner for a long time. Uh, and then the landscaping piece of it, you know, Stephanie really made that a priority, which it wasn't in the past. And, uh, oh, you know, we, we hired, I know nothing about landscaping. I hate digging in the dirt. I hate gardening. <laughs> but I hired really good people. You know, some of them were, you know, we kept the people from before, but we've hired really good people since. And, and they work really hard to, to do this, and they have great vision. Uh, I take no credit for any of that, other, other than when they come to me with an idea, I say, oh, well, okay, let's think about that, and let's see how we can get it done. Uh, but, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing, the transformation that those things have made. Even the parking garage, you know, that's a damn good-looking parking garage. Uh, uh, so, so just those kinds of developments. And now the hospital has their tower that you can see for miles. Uh, I, just, I just think the footprint around here and the future here is really bright. But it's going to be really important, really, really important that we get together and do things for the whole campus, not just one entity or the other, because it's the only way we're going to succeed. Marty. Oh, Marty. Okay, you have to tell something. Behind the scenes, getting, you know, when you work in a place like this and you work on projects from behind the scenes, you know there's all kinds of things that people never realize or never see and or understand the complications that are involved in doing anything on this campus. All of you probably have ideas like that, but you're filled with them because of all the behind scenes, you things that you have seen, maybe had to solve, fix, correct. Um, will well, you share of the, some of those stories, please? The ones that you don't want to know about are the ones that we did and didn't go well. <laughs> well, but uh, those can be good too because you had to have learned from them. Well, it's it's. Well, I was very fortunate when I first came here and I was a zone manager. Again, um, I had been in business and uh, in my prior experiences I had learned how to do plumbing and run gas line and I knew a little bit about electrical. I had not worked in big systems like this, but I had a basic understanding of how it went. And uh, when I first got here, one of the really old, one of the old plumbers who Jim 
uh, Cassidy's no longer with us, and he took me under his wing, and in my spare time, he would take me down in the tunnels, and we would just walk from one end to the next, and he would just, ex he would explain, and he would tell stories about, oh yeah, in 1965, we did, we had four, and we could do this all the time, and we did all, you know, so it was, it was really that kind of thing that, 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 um, made my transition here really smoothly is, is people that would invest their time. To, and I had an interest. I wanted, I, I didn't know, so I didn't know about big air handlers. Like Ron's, Ron's really adept at HVAC and he knows, you know, that was his background and, and I didn't have any of that. And so he, he would take me around and talk to me about air handlers and how they worked and, you know, how the chill water worked. And, you know, so it was, it was really, um, most of my most of my learning has been on the job. I've I've been I'm still in doctorate school. You know I'm I'm still trying to get there, uh, but you know and it's it's all about the people sharing and, and, and their knowledge and things like that. Now Dr. Klein, you know uh, I'll, I'll tell this one story and I think James might remember this as well. We were we were we were doing the Wall West Wall East remodel and you know Dr. Klein's one of the best light guys on the campus. Everybody everybody has a uh, you know you see him in the hallway. He's always smiling. He always has a crack for you. And, you know he gives you the New York thing. And the Yankees are in town this weekend. Are you going to the games? Sunday. All right. So, so we were doing the Wall East, Wall West project, and they were working right above Dr. Klein's office, and they were demoing some plumbing, and and they actually drilled through uh, one of the lines, and um, Dr. Klein's office was not very pleasant, <laughs> and so uh, we were standing there looking at it one day, and. Trying to figure out, oh my God, what are we going to do here? And we looked at all this mess, all of his personal belongings, everything in a big muck, muckety thing. And here he comes down the hallway. He was not a happy camper. <laughs> and he let us know he was not a happy camper. Uh, but again, that's one of those that's one of those relationship building things. It, it's 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 we did a bad thing. We tried to fix it. Uh, and again. Customer service, and uh, it's it's that's what it's about for us. It's the fixing of the stuff. Having good heating and cooling is just part of it, but really the fact that you respond and tell people what you're going to do, and then follow through on it. That's really the key to, to facilities management. The fixing of it uh, is just is just a small part of it. Don Hagen had warned me to get my belongings off the floor long before that. <laughs> oh, okay, good. <laughs> So you're not you're not completely uh, innocent in this. No, of course. Now not. you tell me. I've been feeling bad all these years. <laughs> so, uh, in closing, uh, a, a big round of applause. Hold on a second for uh, for uh, Mr. Rao, and also Jenny Mehmet uh, had a very difficult uh, flight back from vacation. Uh, she probably needs another one now. I think she got back in the house about three in the morning. So she is listening uh, by streaming. So the applause for you and for Jenny for putting together what I think has been a really good leadership series. Yeah. Thank you.